Research is clear that housing is a linchpin for a thriving city. There's really no way to deal with our major challenges if we don't deal with housing. Concentrated poverty, segregation, a lopsided property tax base, lagging economic mobility, student achievement gaps. We can't nonprofit our way out of it. It demands a big, courageous, and energetic policy. And we can cobble together some easy, low-hanging fruit, a collection of tools, and just call it a housing policy. But we need much more than that. We need a robust policy solution that equals the magnitude of our problem. In this presentation, we articulate a policy solution that we think can move the needle at population scale. What you will hear today is not simply the ideas of Opportunity Dallas staff. This package of recommendations was built by a broad range of community stakeholders called the Policy Task Force. We think one of the big reasons that we've never adopted a truly comprehensive housing policy is that we've never really approached it in a collective cross-sector way. It has to be jointly developed by a broad range of stakeholders, which increases buy-in, due diligence, and the overall thoughtfulness of the recommendations. Prior recommendations have been issued by individual organizations with disparate interests, but this represents the broadest and most detailed articulation to date. Opportunity Dallas has brought together a diverse volunteer group of 32 stakeholders, and you can see the types of individuals on the slide, developers, fair housing advocates, education advocates, residents, and more. As the backbone staff behind this effort, Opportunity Dallas leads the overall strategy and logistics on a day-to-day -day basis. The first thing we did was articulate a set of common values, which was no small task for a group this diverse. At the time, we figured if we couldn't even articulate our values, we would have no chance of crafting specific policy recommendations. We issued the Dallas Housing Policy Resolution in November 2017, and it was signed by individual members of the task force. The resolution was shared with the council and received notable media coverage. The main thrust of the resolution is that we urgently need a comprehensive housing policy to promote mixed income and affordable housing throughout the entire city. We need racially and economically diverse neighborhoods, not segregated neighborhoods. Housing is a cornerstone for progress in many areas. After we articulated values, the task force got immediately started on crafting specific policy recommendations based on those values. The task force was meeting every two weeks in the evening since August 2017. Recommendations were proposed, vetted, discussed, debated, and ultimately decided upon with a majority vote. And it's important to note that recommendations were approved by a majority vote, but those members of the task force who opposed a particular recommendation were able to note their personal reservations, and those personal reservations are footnoted at the end of this presentation. It would have been unrealistic to think that we'd get 100% unanimous approval on every single policy recommendation, so we gave members the space to express their specific reservations. However, you'll see that the reservations were few and far between. The purpose of this presentation is not to hand out a fully written comprehensive housing policy with every small detail spelled out. We don't want to micromanage the work of city staff by getting too in the weeds. Ultimately, city staff is going to be responsible for writing the policies and developing the detailed regulations. In this presentation, we're going to provide a high-level overview of the 28 major ingredients of a comprehensive housing policy. It's a multi-year complex effort that will require persistence. We need to understand what the overall journey will look like. But then we'll help sequence it by focusing on the nine specific, immediate, tangible next steps which need to be taken. We're talking broad policy, not specific on-the-ground projects. Before we begin with the policy recommendations, it's important to acknowledge historical context. We are trying to embark upon a new housing policy for the city of Dallas, but we have to understand how Dallas has historically handled housing in the absence of a comprehensive policy. Now, this characterization paints with a broad brush, but it's fair to say that Dallas has relied more upon an ad hoc deal by deal approach centered on negotiations between developers, city council members, and city staff. There has been less emphasis on predictable citywide policies and regulations and more emphasis on project-by-project project discussions within specific council districts. Now, like most cities, there has been the usual collection of tools and programs that have been used, but often in silos. Overall, we have focused on individual deals that are viewed in the moment, and they were not necessarily connected to other deals that were also going on. 
and there has always been political pressure on council members to deliver the deal quickly in their districts. This approach has not produced the results we need at scale. Persistent inequities and segregation have not dramatically changed in a very, very long time. The MVA map looks similar to maps from many decades ago. We cannot continue to do the same thing and expect different results. And this is not about good guys and bad guys or who was right and who was wrong. Many good people were trying to do good things under the old approach, and in many cases they did do good things. But our problems require more than a project-by-project -project approach. There is a new consensus that Dallas needs to adopt a citywide comprehensive policy. But we cannot forget that Dallas has a unique history that has shaped where we are today. And we can dismiss everything that happened in the past as broken, but the more productive approach is to understand this complicated history and learn from the experiences of our past. We bucketed the policy recommendations into four thematic domains, which you can see on the slide. The first domain is the one that has received the most headlines of late, fostering inclusive development in gentrifying areas. In other words, development without displacement. We need to figure out how to manage gentrification in a better way. We don't have a good track record. We have past examples like Little Mexico, which turned into Uptown. Existing lower income residents were fully displaced and now Uptown is unaffordable for them. We have current examples like the displacement crisis in West Dallas. When the deck park begins, it's likely to have a gentrification effect. Longtime residents are faced with rising taxes, rising rents, and flippers seeking to buy them out. And we really have no strategy for this. We don't even have a common workable definition of gentrification. And existing residents are justifiably afraid. Gentrification can be better managed. Many parts of the city are seeing private investments in ways that they haven't before, and that can be a really good thing. Natural market development, it can bring additional job opportunities and resources and services to disadvantaged areas. However, we need policies that can also lock in affordability and protect against involuntary displacement of existing low-income residents so that they too can experience the fruits of progress, right? You can't do mixed income if you push out the poor. It's just more segregation. Gentrification can be a way to achieve more mixed income communities, but it requires smart policy so that new residents can move in and existing residents are not pushed out. We first need to develop a neighborhood change index, NCI. It's kind of a gentrification early warning system. The problem is that by the time people realize gentrification is underway, it's often too late for policies to make a big difference. And NCI tells you early on how susceptible a neighborhood is to gentrification. And with gentrification, there are early signs of it, you know, increases in building permits, the percent of affluent residents moving in, the percent of renters that are cost burden, increases in amenities. The raw data already exists. It's about putting it together in a predictive algorithm. Other cities have mapped gentrification trends with the hope that they could intervene early. LA has an index of neighborhood change. Seattle has a displacement risk index. On the slide, you can see one for Seattle and the Bay Area. And in some places like the Bay Area, the tool has had an impact on policy. Council members in that area say they use the tool to write policy and craft anti-displacement strategies. Each neighborhood would be given a category, uh, such as no susceptibility to gentrification, low susceptibility, moderate susceptibility, or high susceptibility. And the idea is that if we had these categories, it would enable the city to focus policies and resources proactively instead of waiting for a displacement crisis to occur. And we could start with our recent market value analysis, MVA. And we asked Dr. Ira Goldstein, the creator of the MVA at the Reinvestment Fund, and he indicated that they have a displacement risk ratio, which compares home sale prices to income, and it could be overlaid on the MVA. That's a good start, but we should also think about developing a more multi-dimensional tool that looks beyond real estate alone. For example, cultural assets, demographic changes, amenities, etc. We recommend that the immediate next step for council and staff is to have the reinvestment fund build out their displacement risk ratio tool to accompany the MBA. And we should also reach out to other cities that have similar indexes and find national experts that have built multidimensional tools so that we can give ours the most predictive power possible. For domain one, the NCI is the foundational first step. It makes everything else possible. The right side of the slide are the things you do with the NCI once it's in place. And we should start talking about these policies and programs drafting the language, etc. First, 
We should consider a tax abatement policy for existing low-income homeowners in areas that are labeled susceptible to gentrification by the NCI. They may be locked into a mortgage they can afford, but they're still susceptible to rapidly rising property taxes, which increases the likelihood they'll be priced out of the neighborhood. If you're going to have a true mixed income community, low income people need to be able to stay as more affluent residents come in. There are several methods for how to keep taxes under control, such as market segmentation. A policy would also prioritize and target the use of TIFs in gentrifying areas labeled by the NCI. Cities are limited in the percent of area that can be in TIFs. We can't have TIFs everywhere, so we need a policy that focuses TIFs on places where they're needed most, where they can harness increment from market-driven development to preserve affordable housing. These can include a set-aside for proportional infrastructure investments, so for all the new investments in the new bridges and deck parks, investments should also be going into long-time neighborhood parks and streets and community centers. We ought to do more homework and explore more deeply homestead preservation districts, HPDs, and whether we can create them based on the NCI. HPDs are special districts under state law, which can increase home ownership, expand the supply of affordable housing, and prevent involuntary displacement. We could benefit from a targeted land banking policy that says, if the NCI labels an area as susceptible to gentrification, land banking is targeted at that area early on. And that land banking can be used for affordable and mixed income projects to lock in affordability as the neighborhood changes. If the NCI labels an area susceptible to gentrification, there should be a policy which triggers an automatic and institutionalized community input process. Too often, gentrification happens to existing communities, not with existing communities. So policy would require the city to help communities understand the changes that are happening in their neighborhoods early on, increase awareness about potential policy and programmatic options, and garner community input about neighborhood design, i.e. design charrettes. The city should continue to do community engagement for every neighborhood, right? That's just part of the duties of a city and it's part of a good planning process. But we believe that in addition to the city's regular ongoing community engagement, if a neighborhood is highlighted under the NCI as under threat for displacement, then a more robust and specific community process needs to be triggered by policy. In terms of programs, we would recommend two. The Home Buyer Assistance Program can help moderate and lower income families buy their first home, you know, down payment help, closing cost help. Home ownership acts as a buffer against gentrification displacement while also helping people build wealth. But there ought to be a sound vetting process to ensure that families in this program are truly prepared for sustainable home ownership. They can afford the repairs, the utilities, et cetera. The Home Improvement and Repair Program can help lower income homeowners in gentrifying neighborhoods, especially seniors who have trouble making quality repairs to their homes. Flippers and developers are aggressively searching to buy cheaper distressed properties, but many of these homes can last another 100 years or more with proper repair investments. A repair program is a more cost-effective way to protect against displacement rather than financing brand new affordable units. And Dallas has had these programs in the past, but historically it's meant a little bit of money to a few people, not nearly enough to have scalable impact. But that's why having an NCI is critically important because it allows us a data-driven way to target finite resources to a smaller number of gentrifying areas so that, the, so that the dollars will have deeper impact. We should still consider a certain portion of funds for citywide use, but we should push hardest in areas that are identified by the NCI. Now, we can do all of these policies and programs without the NCI but they will be much more effective and efficient if they are driven and targeted by the NCI. We should identify a few key areas that are susceptible to gentrification so that we can target policies and programs in those particular areas. To finish up domain one, we identified a recommendation that isn't contingent upon the NCI, but it's still related to this domain. It would be to have a formal relocation assistance policy a policy which articulates some sort of relocation priority or even a right to return principle when city government action directly leads to the displacement, i.e. changing code standards. In these events, displaced families would be prioritized for assistance. The second domain is to enhance housing choice and reduce systemic barriers so that moderate and low-income families can access 
high opportunity areas. There's mountains of research that show when low income children are able to access a high opportunity neighborhood, their life outcomes can improve dramatically, which in turn helps break cycles of generational poverty. According to research from Raj Chetty, when low income children can access lower poverty areas, educational outcomes and college attendance improves, they're more likely to get married and have children with a father present, they earn dramatically more income over their lifetime, they pay more in income taxes, and they're less likely to be on government assistance. Today, in the city of Dallas, high opportunity areas are prohibitively expensive. Rents and home prices keep getting higher. There are few affordable options remaining in high opportunity areas. And even when there is an affordable option, like for a voucher holder, there are systemic barriers in the way. In Domain 2, we framed our recommendations in terms of the existing barriers that restrict housing choice in high opportunity areas, particularly for low income households. And then we offer recommendations to reduce those barriers. So first, voucher discrimination is a major barrier. Housing choice vouchers, supposed to be the golden ticket to opportunity. They enable a low-income family to move anywhere in the Metroplex. The voucher is reimbursed based on the zip code. There are existing apartments in high opportunity areas where the voucher covers the asked rent, but landlords consistently say no. To deal with voucher discrimination, we recommend both a policy and a program. The policy would be to pass a source of income non-discrimination ordinance. It would basically say that if voucher holders can pay the rent, and meet all the other requirements of tenancy, i.e. screening requirements, then a landlord cannot say no solely because they have a voucher. This anti-discrimination policy doesn't mean that a landlord cannot ever turn away a voucher applicant. They can turn them away for the same legitimate reasons that they would turn away non-voucher applicants, but they can't turn them away solely because they have a voucher. Now we understand there are complications with Texas state law, but our goal with this presentation is to articulate what is good local policy? As a matter of local policy, the majority of the task force believes we should not allow voucher discrimination. And it's important to note that many major cities across the country have passed similar ordinances. For the program, we recommend a sublease guarantor program. Based on corporate rental programs, the city could lease a sizable number of rental units in high opportunity areas and then sublease those units to voucher holders. The Inclusive Communities Project has operationalized this model. The city could also act as a third party guarantor for voucher holders. The reality is that voucher holders face an array of negative and false stereotypes. Sublease and guarantor programs could help alleviate concerns, assure landlords, and could include additional incentives. Second, there are only a limited number of census tracts in the city that meet the definition of a high opportunity area in the first place. So to help expand the pool of high opportunity areas, we recommend a regional voucher mobility assistance program. You know, housing options are regional in nature and vouchers can be used across city lines. A coordinated regional approach would expand the pool of high opportunity areas, help deconcentrate voucher holders and provide a more cohesive support system for voucher holders, which would enable them to cross boundaries more easily. There are national models such as the Chicago Regional Housing Choice Initiative and the Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership. Cities and housing authorities across the region would come together, pool a portion of their vouchers, and provide counseling support across the region. Third, lower income families often have difficulties navigating the private rental marketplace. When you're working several jobs, you're relying on public transportation, it's tough to search apartment by apartment. And moreover, research shows that low income families are more susceptible to inaccurate information and can encounter a general unwillingness to help. We recommend the creation of an affordability exchange. The city could engage technology entrepreneurs and apartment owners to create a mobile friendly, free, easy to search map which shows all of the affordable units in high opportunity areas to various income ranges so that people can see what's available to them in a convenient way. And if landlords participate in the exchange, the city could provide incentives. In addition to the affordability exchange, we think it's important to ramp up mobility counseling services for low income families and voucher holders. Research shows that mobility counseling works to help low income families find rentals in better neighborhoods with stronger schools. Fourth, historically, there's been a lack of fair housing awareness and enforcement in Dallas. To be more proactive, policy should require every project be reviewed by the Office of Fair Housing 
to make sure it'll affirmatively further fair housing and complies with the Fair Housing Act. Fifth, there's a heavy concentration of low-income housing in areas already deeply poor. Part of this is related to low-income housing tax credits, or LIHTC. LIHTC-funded projects have overwhelmingly been placed in high-poverty census tracts. Very, very few are cited in high-opportunity areas. This has led to legal trouble, and it's also not wise public policy. To help deconcentrate low-income housing, we recommend a very clear LIHTC placement policy, which sends guidance to developers in terms of what the city is likely to support with LIHTC. It's really important to have a nuanced placement policy in light of the legal issues surrounding this. Our recommendation is that as the default, LIHTC should go into high opportunity areas. We must correct for the historical imbalance and research also shows it's a best practice. LIHTC should go where it's currently missing in high opportunity areas because it gives low income families access to areas that improve their life outcomes. However, the LIHTC placement policy should allow two exceptions. First, LIHTC could be used as a way to lock in affordable housing in gentrifying areas where rents are rising quickly. Technically, it may not be a high opportunity area yet, but it's well on its way. Second, LIHTC might be supported if the case is made that it's a necessary component of a holistic revitalization plan that will invest significantly in areas beyond housing alone, educational improvements, environmental remediation if there's hazards, health and wellness programs, etc. We define holistic revitalization plans later in Domain 4. Either way, a strong case needs to be made for both exceptions. And finally, there's just the sheer supply issue. There's little affordability in high opportunity areas, and we'll address that next. The third domain is about increasing supply. By any measure, we need a much bigger supply of affordable and mixed income housing throughout the entire city, not just in certain pockets of town. Half of Dallas renters and a third of homeowners are cost burdened, meaning they are living in unaffordable housing. Increasing the supply will require a larger commitment of public and private resources than are currently available today, as well as thoughtful policies which incentivize the private sector to construct and preserve affordable and mixed income housing. The city can't build its way out of the problem. The reality is that housing production is largely a private sector action, but public policies can incentivize the private sector. In this domain, we frame our recommendations in three parts. There are two things that are in the works at the city which are promising. There's one foundational first step that needs to happen, and there are two additional recommendations. So here's what's in the works. Accessory dwelling units. They've been considered by the Zoning Ordinance and Advisory Committee, ZOAC, recently. ADUs are a technical term for granny flats, mother-in-law suites, or garage apartments. ADUs are a second small unit in the backyard of a single family house or sometimes above a detached garage. Many cities have embraced ADUs as a strategy to provide affordable housing throughout the city. Dallas's rules around this are much too restrictive and they stifle the free market. Homeowners should have a right to choose and it's a win-win for everyone. The homeowner who decides to rent his or her ADU gets supplemental income and the renter gets an affordable option. On Opportunity Dallas's website, we have a complete proposal for how to structure this concept in a smart way, including quality control mechanisms, incentives, approval processes for neighborhoods, etc. Overall, it's low cost to the city, can be done immediately, and will produce thousands of affordable units. Voluntary inclusionary zoning is a huge step in terms of scale. Fortunately, Dallas's VIZ, Voluntary Inclusionary Zoning, Version 1.0, it's currently being discussed within the Sustainable Development and Construction Department at the city, and it has been discussed multiple times at ZOAC. VIZ basically means a package of incentives for developers to set aside a percentage of affordable units in their market rate developments. The financial reality of development is that the tenants in affordable units are paying lower rent, which means less income for the developer and the profit margin narrows. It creates a gap. Incentives are designed to offset the gap and to maintain the profit margin for the developer. Incentives can include tax abatements, fee waivers, parking easements, direct subsidies, density height bonuses, streamlining paperwork, and many more. 
The problem is that we have never had a clear, predictable package of incentives for developers so that they know exactly what is on the table if they include affordable units. We need a matrix for what incentives are available under which conditions. For example, if you are building in a high opportunity area and set aside 5% of your units for those at 60% area median income, then you can increase your zoning height from 36 feet to 51 feet. The idea is to have a very clear formula that spells it out. It depends on location, the percent of the set aside, and the income levels. The current version that's being discussed could impact 11,000 acres of multifamily zone land across the city. And our estimate is that it could produce over 13,000 affordable units throughout the city. A couple key points on VIZ. First, it's voluntary. If developers don't like the incentives being offered, they don't have to participate. Mandatory inclusionary zoning has worked well in many places across the country, so a voluntary version could certainly work in Dallas. Second, the current version being discussed at the city doesn't include the strongest incentive, which is direct subsidies. Because of that, the current VIZ proposal doesn't reach households below 60% area median income, or AMI, because when you go lower on AMI, density, height, and parking incentives alone can't fill the gap. This is when you also need direct subsidies. So if we're really serious about including people from all income backgrounds, VIZ should apply not just to the teacher and firefighter, but also the wait staff and janitors. In sum, it's a strong start. It should proceed to council, but over the long term, it'll require more muscle to reach lower incomes. Speaking of more muscle, that brings us to a critical foundational first step, a Dallas Housing Fund. Many task force members think this is the single most important thing. Under the VIZ policy, the strongest, most attractive incentives require funding, funding that the city doesn't have. Density, height, parking incentives only get you so far. In fact, a good number of the recommendations in this presentation require funding that the city doesn't currently have. If we are serious about having a real housing policy, we need a permanent, dedicated, ongoing revenue stream to support it. Over 470 cities have housing funds. You can capitalize the fund through a combination of general obligation bonds, general city funds, TIFs in lieu of fees, taxes, possibly private donations. Cities like Seattle, Charlotte, Atlanta, and Austin regularly seek voter approved bonds to help capitalize their housing funds and have had significant success. The reality is that federal housing dollars are getting thinner. We need to raise local dollars to support this policy. It's not sunk cost. This is about leveraging strategic private investment. According to the Center for Community Change, every $1 in housing funds leverages $6.50 in private sector investment. And the future returns on investment are powerful. So in 2006, Austin went out for $55 million in affordable housing bonds. An analysis by Civic Economics and Housing Works Austin estimated that that $55 million brought in $865 million to the local economy, meaning that every $1 led to $16 in economic activity. Direct jobs such as construction, indirect jobs such as suppliers and materials, increased consumer spending, etc. If we have both resources and smart policies, we can spend dollars in more effective ways. We will certainly have to continually discuss how we capitalize this fund, though voter approved bonds will probably be a big part of the answer as they have been in other cities. As an immediate next step, we recommend that the city create the housing fund entity. It can be administered by a city or non-city entity and provide it with an initial amount of seed funding. It's not gonna be 50 million at the start, but the city can dedicate a few hundred thousand of general funds and possibly cobble together other funding streams. This is foundational and it must start now. If we think that these are good policies, then we must begin to raise the revenues to make it happen. We can't provide an exact dollar amount that's needed, but given the magnitude of the problem, it's safe to say that the ideal dollar amount is far and above what we could realistically raise in the foreseeable future. That's a big part of the task force's message. If we want a muscular housing policy, we need to be prepared to back it up with a major resource commitment. We have two additional recommendations. First, government entities like the city should consider affordable housing when they sell surplus land for redevelopment. 
Texas law enables cities to sell their land at below market value if the sale promotes a public good like affordable housing. When selling surplus land to a developer, the city could mark down the cost of land in exchange for long-term affordable housing provisions. We're certainly not saying that all public land should go to affordable housing, but we recommend adopting a checklist to ensure the city doesn't sell a piece of property without seriously considering whether it can be used to accelerate affordable and mixed income housing. And it's not enough to simply increase the supply. It must be well designed too. There are best practices that foster positive interactions amongst the tenants, i.e. having common spaces, spreading affordable units evenly throughout the building, not isolated in a certain wing, making sure the affordable units are indistinguishable from the market rate units. We don't recommend mandating these things through citywide policy, but we do recommend that the city curate some suggested guidelines. The reality is that developers might not be aware that there is actual research on how to best design an inclusive community. And so this best practice manual could serve as a suggestions guide for them. The fourth and final domain is revitalizing high poverty neighborhoods. To put bluntly, there are too many high poverty areas and not enough high opportunity areas. As discussed earlier in domain two, if low income households want to move out of concentrated poverty into existing high opportunity areas, they should have real realistic options to do so along with support, but not everyone wants to move. Some want to stay in their existing neighborhood for a variety of reasons, even if it is high poverty. So we need to ensure that those areas have increasing access to opportunity as well. And that's why our comprehensive housing policy also prioritizes neighborhood revitalization, because at the end of the day, all people should be empowered with good choices in terms of where to live and enjoy a decent standard of living with dignity. The foundational first step is to designate a few holistic revitalization areas and go deep. Holistic revitalization means addressing multiple challenges in the same neighborhood simultaneously to get the magnitude of change that's really necessary to transform a neighborhood. The task force believes that Dallas has too often resorted to the peanut butter approach to revitalization. Take a pot of economic development money and spread it very thinly to many different parts of the city. But equity doesn't mean dividing equally. Equity means taking a more intensive approach in areas that are struggling more. Research shows that fixing one or two aspects of an under-resourced neighborhood is often insufficient. The peanut butter approach enables us to do small-scale projects in many places, i.e. Wi-Fi here, recreation center there, retail here, housing there. But neighborhoods that have been in poverty for generations need an all-in approach. Neighborhoods in generational poverty require transformative investment that meets a threshold of efficacy almost like a minimally effective dose of medicine. If the doctor prescribes 10 milliliters of medicine, but you only take three milliliters, you've wasted the prescription and you're not gonna get any better. Between the division of economic development bond monies and the various initiatives, Neighborhood Plus, Neighbor Up, Grow South, we have far too many revitalization areas. Nonprofits identify their own areas on top of that. We have neither the resources nor the capacity to do holistic revitalization in all of those areas at the same time. That's the harsh reality. To do it right, the foundational first step is to identify just a few holistic revitalization areas, no more than two to four, every few years. We must proceed in a phased approach where a few neighborhoods are prioritized at a given time. That means focusing and concentrating energies and resources. There needs to be a data-driven way to designate these areas. And this is the idea behind the MVA. Yes, we should definitely focus on areas that have strong market potential for investment, such as areas adjacent to the Cedars. These are the so-called tipping point areas, where a lesser amount of public dollars will activate banks and developers. However, we cannot ignore distressed markets either. We have an obligation to spark progress in areas where private investment is nowhere on the horizon. These more distressed markets will require deeper public investment and subsidy over a longer period of time, which is why we can't spread the peanut butter too thinly. Out of the two to four designated areas, some should be tipping point areas and some should be more distressed. Not doing the peanut butter approach means operating differently politically. We understand that there are 14 single member districts, resources are finite, and re-election is always looming. The easiest political compromise is to generally divide by 14 so everyone gets something. Holistic revitalization cannot exist with that approach. Some areas have more serious revitalization needs 
than others. Once we have our smaller number of holistic revitalization areas identified, we must outline the main components of the plan. What do we actually do in those areas? First, if an area is pegged for holistic revitalization, policy triggers a community input process. Communities must be engaged from the start to ensure the revitalization plans align with local context. The plan would include a pooling and concentration of resources from various public and private agencies in the same area. Each organization probably doesn't have the resources alone to do holistic revitalization. But imagine the difference if Dallas ISD spent its bond monies in that area, the city spent its dollars in that same area, federal funds were targeted in that area, and private investment funds like Impact Dallas Capital were investing in that area. Dollars need to be invested in a multi-year, cross-sectoral way. That means investments in more than one area. Revitalization models that have been successful, like purpose-built communities, which originated in East Lake Atlanta, prioritize investment in three components mixed income housing, pre-K through 12 education, and health and wellness. Housing alone can't do it, education alone can't do it, a recreation center alone can't do it. It must be done together. The pictures on the slide are from the villages of Eastlake, a disastrously poor neighborhood that is now a thriving mixed income community with one of the top schools in the city. Now we can't just take its playbook and replicate every detail here, it's not that simple, but there are generalizable themes. In Eastlake, they pooled about 50 million in federal, local, and private funds and targeted a neighborhood of about 1,500 residents. First, they invested in mixed income housing, 50% market rate, 50% affordable and subsidized. Second, they put in a new pre-K through 12 school focused on STEAM and project-based learning, and its re results are very strong. And third, they invested in robust community wellness programs, a big YMCA, childcare, they brought in children's health, learning gardens, they found that investments in those three aspects, housing, education, and wellness, catalyzed private investment. In fact, it's attracted $175 million in new development like shopping centers and restaurants. The before and after results are remarkable in terms of poverty and crime reduction, employment, etc. When we think about revitalizing, this is the type of cross-sector depth that's needed. And this isn't pie in the sky, there are potential areas right now in Dallas. We should be looking at where Dallas ISD has already designated bond funds to open new choice schools and to reinvest in existing neighborhood schools. There may be vacant land adjacent for mixed income housing and a city park nearby for the wellness component. Those are the types of areas where the city should plug in its own revitalization efforts all under a consolidated plan. But the key is economic diversity. To attract a diverse range of individuals, you need quality housing, quality of life amenities and a strong school. For many residents, a strong school is key. If school improvement isn't part of the revitalization plan, it's probably not a holistic revitalization plan. For designated neighborhoods, policy can also prioritize land banking to clean up delinquent, abandoned, and vacant properties. And policy can incentivize infill development in those designated neighborhoods by offering incentives to developers, such as discounts on tree mitigation or investments in the surrounding infrastructure to make the parcels more attractive. Each holistic revitalization plan should have anti-displacement strategies from the start. If you are developing a neighborhood where low-income people already live and the goal is to make it mixed income, there are things you can do to ensure that folks who want to stay can stay. For example, if you build new mixed income complexes, you can build the new units more densely to allow for the same number of low income units that were previously there. The overall idea is that policy spells out the specific components and prioritizes those plans for funding. It sounds politically difficult because it is. The fundamental political challenge here is that not every community in need can be prioritized first. But communities also appreciate honesty and transparency. We need to be able to speak honestly about the challenges, to acknowledge that this happened through intentional discrimination, to be realistic about the levels of investment and planning that are truly needed, and to acknowledge the limited resources and capacities at our disposal. That said, the final policy recommendation in Domain 4 is very important. While this phased approach is scaling, we can at a minimum articulate a basic set of services, investments, and environmental qualities that all neighborhoods can and should expect in the near term. So even though a community might not have been prioritized in the first round, 
We can outline a minimum floor under which no neighborhood will fall. Everyone deserves a decent standard of living regardless of location. Before identifying minimum standards, though, we must also engage the residents in the community to listen to their needs. Engaging residents is a common theme throughout this presentation. This needs to happen with communities, not to communities. This is our final policy recommendation. We believe that policy should require a racial impact statement accompany housing agenda items that are considered for a council vote. We didn't put this in a particular thematic domain because it reaches into every domain. Housing cannot be divorced from race. It has always been about race. Redlining, mortgage, discrimination, realtor steering, not in my backyard arguments are frequently rooted in racial stereotypes. One cannot take an intellectually honest look at Dallas and say that housing isn't related to race. With a racial impact statement, staff would answer straightforward questions in a few sentences or paragraphs. Questions like, what impact will this action have on certain racial and ethnic populations? Are there specific populations that will be uniquely impacted by the proposed action? Will this action affect compliance with anti-discrimination laws and policies? And if there's a conflict, how can we resolve it? This should not be a long bureaucratic exercise. It should take a short amount of time to complete, but it can be very high impact if done well. This is a national practice that has been implemented in many places. Racial impact statements predict the effect that a council decision will have on minority groups. The impact statement doesn't bind the council into making a particular decision. It's non-binding, but it does make sure that race is explicitly on the table. It enables staff and council members to identify and consider the racial effects of a program, an initiative, a proposed project, or a policy before adopting it. For example, when voting on housing voucher issues, it should be on the public record that nine out of 10 Dallas Housing Authority voucher holders are African American. This would make it clear that the vote the council is about to make uniquely impacts black people one way or the other. Failure to talk honestly about race when making housing decisions is a recipe for bad public policy. This is about being proactive, not reactive. It operates similarly to a fiscal impact statement. It's not about injecting race. It's about bringing to light and acknowledging the racial issues that have always existed and continue to exist in housing policy in the hopes that if we actually talk about it, we can better deal with the disparities. Good public policy is accompanied by measurable outcomes. I think the four domains provide a good framework for how to think about these outcomes. And this is gonna be at the 30,000 foot level. Uh, we would need data analysts to really think through the precise indicators. And we feel that city staff would be best suited to develop these. But we are offering a framework for how to think about outcomes so that we can tell whether the policies are working as designed. In domain one, the key question is, whether gentrifying areas labeled by the NCI are becoming economically and racially diverse, or are they flipping demographics from mostly low income to mostly high income? And you can see the possible indicators on the slide. In domain two, the key question is whether low income households are gaining more access to high opportunity areas. In domain three, the key question is whether we are increasing the supply of affordable housing throughout the entire city. In domain four, the key question is whether we are increasing opportunity in designated holistic revitalization areas. And we could use an opportunity index to track this, which you see on the screen. Opportunity Dallas recently built an opportunity index for Dallas, which we briefed to the city's human and social needs committee in November, 2017. We looked at 14 indicators of opportunity. For example, poverty levels, income, school performance, crime, DCAD, property condition ratings, commute time, access to jobs, groceries, doctor's offices, et cetera. And we ranked all the neighborhoods in Dallas. As you can see in the map on the slide, green areas are the high opportunity areas, yellow are moderate opportunity, orange are limited opportunity, and red are focus areas, the bottom 25%. The goal is to create more diverse neighborhoods that have the opportunity characteristics of a green area. And we can use the opportunity index in two ways. First, we can use it to determine which areas to identify for holistic revitalization in the first place. And second, we can also use it to monitor progress. For example, are red areas turning into orange areas? Are orange areas turning into yellow areas? Those changes would indicate that revitalization plans are working by growing opportunity. And for each indicator, we would need yearly targets. For example, we could say 
By 2022, we want 30 million in the housing fund. By 2025, we want to see 50 million. By 2022, we want to see one revitalization area turn yellow. By 2025, we want three. This requires significant homework and fleshing out, uh, but we believe this framework asks the right questions and proposes some of the key indicators. And finally, adopting a truly comprehensive housing policy is not just a policy effort, it's also an awareness campaign. There's a strong case to make to the public, and we need political leadership. The research is beyond compelling, particularly in terms of return on investment. It's undeniable. We need to embrace the research that housing touches virtually every outcome that matters to a city. If you care about lifting people out of poverty, education, opportunity, economic growth, health and wellness, social cohesion, racial equity, and or crime, it's a direct line to housing. So we've talked about all the major 28 ingredients of a comprehensive housing policy, and your head might be spinning by this point. But now let us sequence this so that we can take one step at a time. Where do we begin? Now this is the last and perhaps most important slide because it focuses on the nine immediate next steps that will set us down the right path. We think these immediate next steps lay the foundation and are the most important to get moving at this time. In domain one, first, create the MCI as soon as possible. Whether we choose to overlay the displacement risk ratio on the MVA or build a new multi-dimensional multi tool from scratch, this is the foundational piece that enables us to do development without displacement. And second, this isn't contingent upon the NCI, but it's a quick win, codifying a relocation assistance policy for city actions that directly cause displacement. Domain two. First, we should reconsider passing a source of income non-discrimination ordinance. Second, we must remain vigilant in our fair housing obligations by empowering the Office of Fair Housing to regularly conduct reviews. And third, we must develop a really thoughtful LIHTC placement policy that prioritizes high opportunity areas while also allowing for gentrification and revitalization scenarios. Domain three, voluntary inclusionary zoning and accessory dwelling units are already in the works. Those should be prioritized and council should consider them shortly. And we need to create the Dallas Housing Fund entity and provide with some seed funding. Domain four, Begin the process of designating a few holistic revitalization areas based on data, no more than two to four areas. This means sacrifice. The number of existing efforts needs to be reduced and consolidated into coherent plans for a smaller number of neighborhoods. And finally, we should start requiring racial impact statements as soon as possible. It's a small lift with potentially huge benefits. On this slide, you can see the members of the policy task force, along with any specific reservations that they expressed.